My name is Richard T. Scott. I'm a contemporary figurative painter, and uh, I live in New York, Paris sometimes. Uh, inspiration for this body of work um, was really uh, an investigation of the questions of death and the soul and the possibilities of what might come after death. Uh, perhaps darkness, perhaps reincarnation, perhaps some other state of being. I don't know. But uh, through, through this, I felt like I had discovered something about the nature of the, the contrast between beauty and ugliness. I felt, I felt that beauty was an act of faith, in a way. And ugliness is, is an act of doubt. Um, but neither of them can exist without the other. My artistic process is largely inspired by my life and the experiences that I, that I live. You know, um, it's, it's really about being, being open to the world around me and, uh, and digesting everything that comes my way. So not, not so much about the, the you know, typical kind of artistic idea that, that the painter is, is only delving in his own self, you know, in his own psyche. Uh, I, think, I think it's much more an interaction. Other than exhibiting at, at a dark art gallery, uh, this body of work really came together while I was living in Paris. Um, there was such a, an incredible sense of um, melancholy uh, in terms of the, the place that I was living was, was this, this decaying mansion uh, on the outskirts of Paris. And, and something about the aesthetics of that place really inspired me to investigate these themes. And so I would go to the, to the market every day and uh, admire, you know, in France you can, you can find these entire birds with their heads and their claws still on and skinned rabbits and everything, something you don't really find in the United States at the market. And I was just absolutely um, enamored by these, these beings. I mean, they were, they were at one time, they're creatures that had the, po the potential to fly and yet now they cannot fly, and they've turned into something we consume. So um, I did exhibit these pieces uh, in Paris, uh, several of them, not all of them, but it's, it's been just kind of a vein of thought that I've been exploring for the past two years. The best studio conditions uh, for, my, for my creative process, I've found, uh, are really to actually be able to, to move around and go to different places, go to different cities. Uh, primarily, though, the main thing that I need from a technical aspect is the ability to change the light and manipulate the light. So many different light sources, uh, natural light, um, you know, halogen light bulbs of different colors. So that, that's primary to my uh, process, I think. The title Effigies and Idols arose out of many years of discussions uh, you know, between Adam Miller and myself, and it, and it simply made sense. We were trying to, to put words onto the, the themes that we'd been wrestling uh, with in our work for, for many years. And um, we were sitting around one night, you know, having a glass of wine and, and just brainstorming and uh, and. I was thinking specifically of this piece um, behind me that I did of, of Deborah Feldman, and it came to mind that all of the works, not just this one, were were idols. It was that they're a response to um, the last you know century of of art making uh, in terms of the fact that for for representational work, there's been kind of an iconoclasm. Uh, at one point, uh, which is, has now changed, and now we live in this wonderful, you know, world where everything is. Uh, there's a dialogue between conceptual and, and representational art. There's a lot of thing, a lot of things going on. But I felt like much of what we were doing, the work itself, the very nature of the technical skill, was in a way idolatry, um, in response to this iconoclasm. And in many ways, a lot of the themes we we're we're using uh, relate to that idea. Adam and I participate quite a bit in this larger group of, uh, I would say, not just representational painters in, in the New York and tri-state area, but, but what I think are, are incredibly innovative and um, groundbreaking painters, people who, who are, are, are trying to delve into not just skill and technique, but also vision. They want to communicate something powerful and emotive and, and eloquently. Um, and I find that both of us 
I can't speak for him, but I, I imagine he feels the same. I find both of us are incredibly inspired through interacting and sharing ideas with this larger group. You know, in, in many ways, this, the, the same collaborative competition that Adam and I in, enjoy with each other, uh, we, we share that with, uh, with others, such as Martin Whitfoot and Jason Yarmosky. I really enjoy speaking on panel discussions and being incredibly involved in, in all facets of the art world because uh, I think that what we're doing is not just creating paintings or, or decor. Uh, we're, we're trying to uh, influence culture. We're trying to move culture into a direction that we feel is, is um, better for, for humanity. Of course, I, you know, I wouldn't uh, have the presumption to say that I know where, where everything should go. But I think I have a few ideas that I can contribute. And uh, I think that if everybody does that with, with sincerity and intelligence and passion, I think that we can solve a lot of the problems um, in the larger scale that our society is facing today. I was born in Georgia, and uh, I spent uh, quite a bit of time living in Brooklyn, uh, and then Paris after that, and now I'm back in, in the New York area. And I think that's, it's, it's really, um, opened up uh, an understanding uh, in, in, in my life and in my work for, for the larger culture of the world and, and human nature and uh, so many different aspects. I think comparing and contrasting these various cultures has really been enriching and instructive. I mean, especially because I spent the first 25 years of my life in Georgia and I had never really left. I never went, in, went anywhere. I had very little access to outside culture didn't really go to museums. I felt incredibly isolated. And so uh, my travels have been a way of, of um, freeing myself from these kind of, I guess, dogmas and constraints that I, were, that I was taught um, from my childhood that I might not necessarily want to continue with, you know? I think the, the reason why I first began uh, pursuing um, the classical traditions and representational art really was a, a desire for, for expressing myself um, eloquently and articulately and emotively in, in a way that I, I couldn't seem to shape into words. There, there were things that I, I, I thought, things that I understood visually and emotionally, uh, kind of metaphysical principles perhaps, that I, I felt like I wanted to communicate. And I began actually as, as uh, more of an abstract expressionist painter, uh, but I found over the years that it, it simply wasn't um, conveying uh, what I wanted to convey, and so I had to refine uh, my technique. There is quite a bit uh, of solitude in, in all of my paintings, even the paintings that se seem to be a bit more positive and optimistic and what I would say is classically beautiful. All of them seem to have this kind of haunting loneliness in them. And I think the reason why is because I see melancholy um, as, as, as the confluence between sadness and beauty. It's not merely sadness. It's actually a, it's a path. It's, melancholy is a path through the darkness. And, and, and through this darkness, I, I find, through being baptized by the shadows, um, you can find catharsis and perhaps rebirth on the other side. And this is one of the reasons why there's such a strong uh, chiaroscuro in most of my work. Um, this this uh, visual metaphor is, is very important to me. The focus on, on fowls and, and birds in, in uh, this body of work, I think, is, is very much about um, an exploration of the, pin, you know, the loss of the potential of flight, of transcendence. It, it relates very much to the theme of the larger body of work, uh, questioning um, the idea of the, of the spirit or the soul, uh, especially the human spirit, and, and its presence and absence. So that's why there's also not, not only um, dead birds, but a lot of the paintings have this atmosphere, this kind of smoke or fog or haze. I wanted to give an essence of, of you know, flight, or the, at least the potentiality of flight and, and the weight of, of our, our corporal, corporeal nature, our bodies, and the eventual flesh that we are, that will be simply uh, a dead carcass in the end anyways.
Song of Deborah spans a Zarathustrian abyss between time and culture. Deborah is three idols, synthesized in one woman's timeless struggle against patriarchy. A dimensionless number, she is Deborah, wife of the torch, a mother in Israel, the only female judge of the Hebrew Bible suspended in a collusive atmosphere. Secondly, Deborah is Europa, carried across a frozen lake by Zeus, who takes the form of a blue heron rather than a white bull. Her shredded garb evokes a more assertive version of Titian's Rape of Europa. She is unabashedly engaged in the release of death to allow for new life. Finally, she is Deborah Feldman, author of the controversial memoir Unorth Unorthodox. Emancipated from the repressive traditions of her birth, challenging the deepest taboos of the ultra-Orthodox community. Here, the power dynamics between she and Zeus are fully reversed. Rather than he bearing her away in virginal fear, she grips his leg, hauntingly recalling Kaparot, the ritual of atonement in which the faithful brandish a chicken over their heads, transubstantiating their sins onto the sacrifice. This unlikely equilibrium conjures the lost melody of Deborah's victory song, echoing in our collective unconscious. The Song of Deborah is a piece um, inspired by uh, a good friend of mine, Deborah Feldman, who's a controversial author. Uh, I, was, I was really interested in, in many things, uh, exploring the, the, the theme of, of death and rebirth throughout this entire body of work. Uh, through through this metaphor of her life, so you know the story story of Deborah Feldman is is one of um, triumph uh, of escape, uh, but first one of of pain and, and repression. She grew up in a Hasidic community, a small Hasidic community uh, that was incredibly repressive of women, and uh, she was she was um, in an arranged marriage at the age of sixteen. And she had a tremendous difficulty uh, in in that in that lifestyle. They, you know, they didn't really want to allow her to to learn how to read English, and so she ended up sneaking away and teaching herself how to read and write. And eventually, she escaped uh, and wrote a book about her her life. Um, and so, for me, this again was a kind of uh, a kind of death and rebirth, a kind of baptism through the darkness. This this birth of this new Deborah Feldman, uh, empowered and, and, and free from, from these, uh, you know, restraints. This, this painting um, was executed over a period of uh, about two and a half months. Uh, it, it originated really through, uh, I, I would say the concept and the symbolism really originated through a collaboration between Deborah and I. Um, we 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 knew that we wanted to kind of work together on this piece, um, but uh, we we had a lot of uh, you know a lot to discuss to get through the ideas to to decide how we were going to present it. At one point, I was thinking of more of kind of a straightforward Lucian Freud or Jenny Saville approach, where she's you know we knew immediately we wanted to address this menstruation because it was a. It's, it's one of the biggest taboos of the Hasidic community, and it's a symbol in many ways for this kind of liberation, uh, this, this um, appreciation of womanhood and life and, and the power of femininity that I wanted to kind of express. So, um, so yeah, it was, it was very much a, a collaboration all the way until the very last day. She came and modeled for the, for the painting. We talked about the themes, and um, it was a, it was a, it was, something else. On the bottom corner of the Song of Deborah is, uh, there is a man staring up from the depths of the ice. It looks like he, he could be standing perhaps right beside the viewer or could be the viewer, him or herself, uh, looking at this scene. Um, but the man is, is, is in fact looking directly at the viewer and uh, I think, or I hope, challenging the viewer, challenging the viewer to contemplate their own views, their own, uh, if, if they're shocked by this image, questioning why they're shocked by this image. So it, 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 is, it is actually a self-portrait. Not to say that I'm standing there in judgment, but uh, I, I, I felt like in, in, in some way it, it related to, uh, to the theme of the, the place of the artist as a, as a reflection of society and as the uh, kind of um, not the inquisition of society but but one who 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 brings up these kind of reflections 
and, and challenge the viewer to address their own issues. There's a long tradition of uh, artists painting themselves uh, into their paintings in larger narrative paintings and then also in uh, straightforward self-portraits. And a lot of it originates you know, during the Renaissance where artists were first seen as craftsmen uh, and by painting themselves in the place of the wealthy patron who commissions the painting, um, they're saying, I am uh, worthy of, of, being, of being respected. I am, in fact, an intellectual. I am a, I'm not simply a craftsman. Um, and I, I feel like, uh, in many ways, uh, going forward to, to today, it, it, using yourself as a model in, in paintings uh, brings a lot more of a, of a psychological nature into the piece, in my opinion, because um, we, we all view ourselves in many different ways. And I, I feel like when we look at ourselves in the mirror, uh, depending on different days, it's distorted in different ways. Because I think we're able to see other people more objectively than we can see ourselves. And so I think that inherent dis distortion is incredibly fascinating. If I could dig up an artist from the past and consume their brains for more artistic power, uh, my first impulse would be to say Rembrandt. Uh, I think in many ways Rembrandt is, is a zombie in, in his own right. I mean, everyone who looks at his work um, is consumed by them in many ways. Their, their minds are consumed by the work as much as the work is consumed by, uh, by their minds. Uh, although uh, I would have to say uh, Leonardo da Vinci's brain might go a little better with a glass of Chianti. <laughs>